love it. Yes, that's true. And erosion and water quality, do those things bother you? Well, sure, I had my doubts, just like you, but, well, see for yourself. Cherry? Right. Clear cut? Eight years ago. It looks good. Joe's my neighbor. Good friend, though you might have thought we were having an argument there. You see, he's got a wood lot, too, with lots of nice hardwoods. But he's not sure he wants to cut them. Says he's worried about the forest looking ugly and about the effect of logging on the land, the water, and wildlife. Joe knows I had some of the same concerns before I looked into the matter and learned why you sometimes need to clear cut. He wanted to see what I'm doing, and I arranged for us to visit other places to show him different ways of harvesting timber and how to make sure he gets what he wants in his next stand of trees. Joe and I had a special tour of the Monongahela National Forest. And the ranger explained that some of our most valuable hardwoods were, in part, the result of clear cutting. Early Americans needed the wood. And the clear cutting, along with wildfires and storms and later the chestnut blight, cleared large sections of forest and made possible the growth of fine stands of hardwood. You see, hardwoods are renewable, but many of the most valuable species are intolerant of shade. They won't develop in the shade of other trees. To assure a future supply of black cherry, walnut, oak, yellow poplar, and other valuable hardwoods, in the absence of fire or other natural means of opening up the forest, we may need to clear cut. Joe and I were shown an area on the Monongahela that was clear cut in 1968 or 69, when there was public concern about the impact of the cutting on wildlife and water quality, and whether the forest would grow back. We were shown other areas too, one recently clear-cut. One of the major criticisms of clear-cutting is that it spoils the looks of the land. But the effect is temporary, like that of a cornfield after harvesting, or a home under construction. And it's minimized by making small clear-cuts with irregular shapes. The forest grows back quickly, Two years after clear-cutting, there's lots of trees fighting for the sun, including some valuable hardwoods intolerant of shade. At five years, some of them are 10 feet high. By 10, they're developing into sturdy saplings. At 15, they stand 35 to 40 feet high. And 20 years after clear-cutting, they measure four to five inches in diameter at breast height with some dominant trees. Another thing folks say about clear cutting is that it destroys the nests and feeding grounds of animals and birds. But wildlife is still there, making use of the forest as it changes. Stump sprouts and twigs and leaves from newly felled trees provide food for deer and other browsing animals. And small openings add to the forest edge providing cover near the food. During the first 10 years of regrowth, the young forest has lots to offer, and most animals and birds take advantage of it. As saplings develop into pole stands, there's more shelter, but not as much food. But when the woodlot is 40 years old, seeds are abundant, cavities begin to develop, the understory thrives, 
and so does the wildlife. Something else that Joe's concerned about, lots of other folks too, is what clear cutting might do to forest soils and water. Erosion can occur in any type of timber harvesting. It becomes a problem only if eroded soil material gets into streams. But foresters who study erosion say that the major source of trouble is not the cutting of trees, but poorly planned logging roads and log landings. And the amount of damage depends not so much on the volume of timber removed as on when and how it's done. Working after rain or winter thaw is especially harmful. But care in constructing and using haul and skid roads really pays off. There's less soil disturbance and less mud in the creeks. And wildlife can benefit from logging roads that are seeded and fertilized after use. In the central and southern Appalachians, the loss of nitrates and other soil nutrients following clear cutting is usually not significant and usually disappears in two to three years. There is a rise in water temperature in clear cut areas, an increase of about eight degrees in summer, but it quickly drops back down as the stream enters the woods. The increase is just about eliminated by leaving buffer strips 80 to 100 feet wide along streams. In any case, the rise in temperature is usually gone after five years' growth. Plants and organisms in streams can be affected by these changes in temperature and siltation, and in turn affect fish. But most of the impact is short-lived and can be minimized by building roads carefully and providing buffer zones along streams. Since our trip to the Monongahela National Forest, Joe's got a different notion about clear cutting. He knows now that it's not just a logging method, but that it's one of the ways of renewing and improving a wood lot. And he realizes that he can harvest the kind of timber he wants without also bringing in a lot of troubles. The starting point is to remember that trees take up all the growing space available. And just as wind and fire and other natural forces open up a forest to intolerant hardwoods, so you and I can create the growing space for our next generation of trees. First thing we need to do is make sure that the kinds of trees we want will grow in our woodlot. Such things as soil composition, moisture, temperature, and access to sunlight determine what grows on a site and how well it develops. Getting a tree to grow off-site requires more planning and effort than growing it in its natural environment, but may be possible and worth the extra work. In the Appalachians, unless you want to change the composition of a stand, you don't need to do any planting. There are enough sources of regeneration right there on the forest floor to do the job. In fact, there are so many seeds that it's seldom necessary to wait for a heavy seed crop before cutting. They're spread around by gravity and wind, water and animals. Some of them remain dormant for years on the forest floor and still produce a tree. Some seeds last over winter, and some have no dormant capacity. Stump sprouts are another source of natural regeneration. Seedling sprouts, from stumps under two inches in diameter, are more likely to be healthy than those from large stumps. And if a stump rots, a sprout that starts at the ground or near it will usually be healthy. 
Some trees need a head start to be able to compete with others that grow faster. Most Appalachian hardwoods need this advanced reproduction, as the foresters call it. Black cherry, white ash, basswood, and these red and white oaks. Most folks around here harvest their timber by high grading, uh, removing all the trees over a certain diameter limit. They cut down all the best trees without thinking about what will take their place. Those that are left, poorly formed, less desirable trees, dominate the overstory, while shade tolerant trees develop in the understory. There are several harvesting methods you can use to get the next generation of trees to be what you're looking for. There's a partial cut, which leaves a lightly thinned canopy and makes the least disturbance of the area. But over time, a partial cut changes the makeup of the stand. And intolerant hardwoods give way to one or two species that germinate and grow under the shade of other trees. Another regeneration method is shelter wood, which leaves some dominant trees as a partial canopy for five to 10 years, while undesirable trees are removed and those that are desired get a head start. But then the canopy is removed, letting the seedlings and sprouts develop into an even aged stand. Then of course there's clear cutting which removes the entire canopy, allowing the growth of intolerant trees in an even-aged stand. This is a cherry maple stand with valuable Appalachian hardwoods. And there's no shortage of seeds. Well, birds scatter black cherry seeds over a limited area. And over a larger one, the wind distributes seeds of white ash, basswood, red maple, and sweet birch. These trees need that head start, and seedlings and sprouts, almost always around, need to be at least six inches high, preferably two feet. If that advanced growth is there, clear cut the saleable trees, leaving a few good tolerant saplings, and cut or kill the others over two inches diameter at breast height. If there's not enough advanced growth, use shelter wood cutting, starting five to 10 years before your final harvest. This is an oak hickory stand. Oaks are the most difficult Appalachian hardwoods to reproduce. Black walnut and hickory produce seeds every two or three years, while oaks produce acorns at two to 10 year intervals. The seeds are heavy and stay where they fall unless animals carry them off. Of all hardwoods, oaks are the most dependent on advanced reproduction. Seedlings and sprouts develop in the understory but grow slowly, even in full sunlight. On higher quality sites, they need to be about four and a half feet high to compete with other trees when the canopy is removed. How you remove the canopy depends on the quality of the site on which the stand is growing. On lower quality sites, where oaks grow to less than 60 feet in 50 years, you should clear cut. On higher quality sites, where oaks grow 70 feet or more in 50 years, you should use a shelter wood cut and remove the competing understory. In late spring, if you have a good seed crop, let the acorns mature and make the initial shelter wood cuts in the winter. Once the oak seedlings have grown to about four and a half feet, remove the remaining overstory. This is a stand of mixed Appalachian hardwoods. There's usually plenty of seeds here and advanced reproduction. 
So you'll get lots of new trees, but not necessarily what you want. Intolerant ones will start, but won't develop unless the overstory is removed. So if you're looking for intolerant trees with some tolerant ones mixed in, clear cut using small openings of at least a half acre. If you want tolerant species only, use some partial cutting, such as single tree selection. Whatever regeneration method you use, you may have to deal with certain problems. If you have grape vines, you need to control them before they take over the canopy of the new stand, about eight to 10 years after clear cutting. Ferns and other undesirable growth in the understory, like striped maple or beech, should be cut out or herbicided so the seedlings and sprouts you want will have growing space. If you have lots of deer, they'll eat the young growth and you'll have to use shelter wood or clear cutting. You can leave brush and treetops, making it difficult for deer to get to seedlings and sprouts, and increase the number and size of openings so they'll have more food than they need. Planning and managing harvests and regeneration can get tricky, and it's a good idea to get help from the professionals state, industrial, and consulting foresters. Joe, take a look at this stand back here. Joe knows what he wants to do now with his wood lot. He knows if he uses a partial cut, the stand will gradually be taken over by trees that like the shade. If he wants intolerant trees, he needs to use shelter wood or clear cutting. If he does clear cut, he can minimize the undesirable effects by using small openings with irregular edges that blend into the woods, buffer strips along streams, and well-planned roads and log landings. Joe's pretty excited, too, about harvesting timber, protecting the environment, and making sure that in the future he has the kind of trees he wants on his wood lot. Books with more information about programs in this series are available from your extension agent.